Thou wast transfigured on the mount, O Christ our God, revealing thy glory to thy disciples as far as they could bear it. Let thine everlasting light shine upon us sinners through the prayers of the Theotokos, O giver of light, glory to Thee. Hi there. Welcome back to another live Bible study on 1 Corinthians inspired by the homilies of St. John Chrysostom. I am Father Athanasios Heros. I'm the Dean here at St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Tarpon Springs, Florida, and I'm your host for Be Transfigured Ministries. I remembered to turn my microphone on today, so that's a good start to a good evening. Uh, if you're new to our Bible study, welcome. It's good to have you. If you're uh, returning, welcome back. Let me share with you, if you're new, how our Bible study works. I mentioned it is inspired by the homilies of St. John Chrysostom. Here's basically how it works. In the year, we think 385 AD, somewhere around there, when St. John Chrysostom was a priest in Antioch, he did a Bible study series on 1 Corinthians. Now, we call these homilies, but they were not liturgical homilies. And we know that because the breaking up of the passages does not line up with the lectionary, as opposed to his homilies on Romans and Acts that does break down into the same readings as the daily readings from the lectionary. So we know that this was actually a class atmosphere that he was teaching. I don't know if you'd call it a class, but it was not liturgical. It wasn't part of the daily services of the church. Uh, so we take a homily and we read the homily, hopefully in advance. Did you all, I know you probably didn't read the homily because you weren't here last week. Did you read the homily? 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 Okay. Um, and then we have what we call the text analysis, which is where the traditional kind of chapter and verse understanding of what St. Paul is teaching us. And then St. John Chrysostom, inspired sometimes by one word, one verse, launches into what I call life application, some kind of a moral teaching that helps us change and live a new life. I mention all the time that even if we memorize the scriptures, if it does not somehow change our life, it is a useless exercise. So our Bible study has both chapter and verse, what I call the text analysis and the life application, something from the homily that inspires us in changing our life. There is a study guide. If you have not yet downloaded the study guide, you can find that at my website, liveanewlifeinchrist.org. And if you press the button for Bible studies, you will see all of the Bible studies that we have finished so far for 1 Corinthians. You'll also, by the way, find our homily series, our Bible study series on the book of Romans. And just scroll down. Tonight is session 32. And you'll click there. It has a link to the homily, also has a link to the video. But of course, if you're watching this video, then you don't need the link to the video because you're already watching the video. Speaking of watching the video, you probably saw an ad, a commercial pop-up. We are currently uh, asking for donations to keep Be Transfigured Bible Studies ad-free. We got a donation last week. Thank you very much. Uh, and so if you'd like to make a donation, there's a donation button, a fundraising button on the, uh, um, what's that thing, on, on YouTube. Or you can go to our website, liveanewlifeinchrist.org slash give, and you can identify Keep Be Transfigured ad-free as the purpose of your donation. Of course, we're in the middle of our Nativity Fast fundraising period. Our goal this year is to raise $2,000, which will pay for all of our web hosting for next year and our podcast hosting for next year, and we are almost halfway to our goal. And we've only been one week into the fast, so we're making good progress. I'm thankful for that. There is a chat room. If you're new, the chat room, you must be watching on YouTube. And if you look at your screen at the bottom right corner, you can launch this on YouTube if you're watching it either on your 
on Facebook, if you're watching it on my website, you have to be in the YouTube app in order to participate in the live chat. The live chat is moderated by my Presvita Ravasi, who is also a graduate of Holy Cross Seminary. Some people don't realize that. She is brilliant. She's much smarter than I am, although I don't readily admit that, but now I just told the whole world, so what's the difference? Um, but she is there, so every now and then she might text me a question from the chat room. So I can see right now we have uh, Angeliki from Canada has already logged in. We have Ray and Jane from Land Lake. So we have Florida, we have Canada. Let's see how many different countries we can get. Last, last week we had, I think, four different countries participating on the live chat. So you were on the live chat last week because of your car accident. Tell me, how different is it being in the room versus being in the live chat? It's a little different. It's a little different. Couldn't hear the Bible verse too well. You couldn't? Oh, I, oh yeah, that, right. So uh, I am still trying to figure out why our old microphone system doesn't work. It works in my computer but does not uh, patch through to the software for the live stream. So I've asked my engineer, Harry, my son, to look into it. Hopefully by our next Bible study, um, we'll have something figured out. Because I know it's difficult not being able to hear what you all have to say. There are people in the room, by the way. It's not just me and a camera. Uh, that being said, I had a dilemma that the guys here helped me resolve. We were going to have one more Bible study this year, being next week, and then take a break until January, until I realized that if we do that, we're going to be taking a break right in the middle of chapter 13. And chapter 13 in 1 Corinthians is the very famous love chapter. And I don't want to have a, a two-month gap in the middle of one chapter. So as much as it pains me to admit, this will be the last Bible study for the year 2023, session 32. That means when we come back at the end of January, we have 12 sessions that we gotta get in to finish this project. So we're gonna get them, I double checked, we have enough Tuesdays with my travel schedule, but this will be our final Bible study for the year 2023. It is session 32, that means it covers homily 31, and it includes 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 21 through 26. Have I forgotten anything? I think I've made all my necessary announcements, yes? Okay, and again, welcome to our, we have a couple of new people in the room today. It's good to have you with us. Hopefully you'll be with us again in January. Oh, very quickly, did you do your homework? Read the, read the right? Read the who, who all got the homework? Read 1 Corinthians in its entirety that last, this past week, anybody? Oh, I thought it was just the homily. I thought the entirety was during the break. Well, it's always, all right, so since you've got two months off before our, next, before our next live stream, try to read 1 Corinthians as many times as you can, just to absorb it. Don't stop, don't take notes. For me, it takes about an hour or so to get through the whole thing. Find some time where you can sit in, in a nice, comfortable chair and just read it front to end so you can absorb the, the direction and the kind of literary style because it is, a, it is a beautifully written thing. Sometimes we forget when we're stopping on this verse and stopping on that verse and stopping on this verse. We, we lose the, the full picture that, that St. Paul's trying to do. So let's try and get that done before our next Bible study, which is January, if you want to mark this in your calendars. January 30th will be our next live Bible study. So that gives us two months, a little over two months, to go back and watch 31 sessions prior to tonight to get caught up if we're a little behind. All right, let's go ahead and say our prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Shine within our hearts, loving Master, the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds that we may comprehend the message of your gospel. Instill in us also reverence for your blessed commandments, so that having conquered sinful desires, we may pursue a spiritual life, thinking and doing all those things which are pleasing to you. For you, Christ our God, a light of our souls and bodies, do we give glory, together with the Father, beginning in your all holy, good, and life creating spirit, always, now, and forever, and to the ages of ages. 
Amen. Okay, who wants to read good and loud? Because as Michael said, they can't hear you at home unless you're really good and loud. Now, so you know, Mr. Reader down over there thinks he speaks loudly, but obviously it wasn't loud enough, right? Okay, so uh, Michael, verses 21 through 26, good and loud for everybody back home. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. In fact, the member of the body which seems to be weaker are indispensable. The members of the body which we think are less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, while our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Although our more presentable parts have no such need, but God put the body together, giving more abundant honor to the inferior part, so that there should be no division in the body. Instead, the members should have the same care for one another. When one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And when one member is glorified, all the members rejoice with it. Okay, that's it, that's it right there. That's it. And it took me a couple of sentences to figure out you're using a different translation, so. <laughs> I'm like, is he reading something different? Then I realized it was just a different translation. Okay, and that's okay. That, there was 110, I think, or 111 last time I checked, English translations of the Bible. Not all of them are good. I won't get into that right this moment. Okay, so let's dig right in. By the way, if, if you're new to our Bible study, if you see the section numbers on the study guide, those line up to the section numbers the editors have put into the, into the homily. So if you want to find that quote in the homily, you know what section to go to. And that's just what the editors did. There's no other function behind that than the, than the, than the people who edited the edited the homily, okay? All right, so uh, section one of the homily covers uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 21. So I'll just read it again. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Point number one, lacking even the weakest link hurts the church. Now remember the context here, right? So if we go back for a few weeks, the context is our unity, it is the Eucharist, it is all of the gifts and talents that we all have within the church, right? And this is the context that St. Paul is addressing here. How we are responding to each other in terms of our gifts, in terms of our talents, in terms of our uh, blessings. Lacking even the weakest link hurts the church. Uh, Chrysostom says this, For though the gift be less, yet it is necessary. And as when the one is absent, many functions imp are impeded, so also without the other there is a main there is a maim in the fullness of the church. Now finally, St. John Chrysostom is linking to the church, right? And then St. Paul is, uh, helps us understand this is not, obviously we're not talking about eyes and ears, but we're talking about the church. And just one person who might have a weaker talent, a less honored talent or gift, if we don't have that person, the entire church is weak. Right? And so this is an important thing, remember, because this is how St. Paul is inspiring us to our unity and to our mutual honor and respect. Okay, so if we lose even the weakest link, the, the, the entire church is affected. It is not even an option to leave the weakest link out. How many people are sim ah, we don't need that person. That person's not, you know, they're not covering, they're not carrying their weight anyway, right? This is the temptation in our, in our fallen consciousness. So point number two, it is not even an option to leave the weakest link out. Chrysostom says this, so that even though it wish it, though it should actually say so, it is out of the question, nor is the thing consistent with nature. Remember, there's that connection between if it makes sense naturally, it makes sense in the church. You can't say to the foot, I don't need you because then you're going to fall over and you can't walk. You can't say to the eye, I don't need you, because then you're going to bump into things, right? This is the, the importance there. Okay, section two, 
verses 22 and 23. I'll read them real fast. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unrepresentable parts have greater modesty. Point number three, nothing God creates is dishonorable. I think that's one of those if we just embrace that, the world could change. Nothing God creates is dishonorable. For nothing in us is dishonorable, seeing it is God's work. Now that doesn't mean that just because God made it, that in its weakness we can't improve. That's the temptation of the modern version of, well, God made me the way I am. It doesn't mean that we can't be better. It just means that because God made us, we are worthy of that distinction. I think that's an important thing. So maybe that's the one thing. It's not dishonorable because God made it. The, thing that, the things that seem dishonorable are needed more. Of course, St. Paul references the unpresentable parts. In Chrysostom, if you read the homily, is a little bit more graphic in his portrayal of the unrepresentable parts. But he's talking about our private parts. So that he, uh, where am I? Here we go. Yea, rather, were one to consider accurately, these parts in question are even by nature itself both honorable and necessary. Right? So if I could just translate this back to the idea of the church. Everyone in the church, even though they seem insignificant in the greater working of the church, they are significant and they are important. I think that's what Christendom wants us to see here, right? And, you know, it, it's kind of like if I can stretch it a little bit. There's a temptation in the church to say that, you know, there are certain people who are more important than other people. There's the big debate, you know, between clergy and, and laity, right? You know, the clergy, some people think are more important than the laity. Some people think it's the opposite. The laity are more important than the clergy. Truth be told, we can't do it without either one of us, right? I am not a priest without people, and the people are not a church without a priest, right? So that temptation to, to say, oh, you're not significant, therefore you don't matter. Even the, even the seemingly insignificant parts are just even maybe sometimes more important, right? And within the working of the church, that's the various ministries. You know, just because someone sits in the office answering the phones does not make them less important to the ministries than the priest. You know, or George who sets up this room for us every week, right? Is he less important because he's a custodian? Frankly, he's probably more important because if he didn't, if he didn't set this room up, we couldn't have Bible study tonight, right? This is the essence that I think that Chris Dom wants us to see there. All right, section 3, verses 24 and 25. And 24 and 25 will carry us over and also into section 4. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. So let's see now, this is section three and four, point number five in the study guide. Unity is more important than individual strengths. I just want to pause here before I read this. So this current schism between Moscow and Constantinople is a schism that is about organizational purposes of the church is not about theology. 
if you look back through church history, unity was always more important than the minutia. The church has always done everything it could to maintain its unity, even among this, even, even in the midst of disagreement. We would sometimes, if you look back historically, even some of the famous heresies, the church went on decades, all still in unity with each other, trying to resolve these disagreements until finally we couldn't resolve something. But unity is always the goal, okay? And this is the importance of understanding the body. You know, if you look, for example, uh, the one of the 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 purposes of the um, of the of the ecumenical councils was the unity of the church, because we don't want separation, we want unity. So there's that word schism in this English translation. I think you have division in your in your translation there. All right. So there's my little soapbox for a moment. Point number five. Do you see that the care of these latter is connected with making provisions for those? For they have not their being so much in their own nature as in their being one by virtue of the body. Wherefore, if the body perish, they profit nothing by such health as they have se severally. But if the eye remain, or the nose, preserving its proper function, yet when the bond of union is broken, there will be no use for them even after. Whereas suppose this remaining and those injured, they both support themselves through it and speedily return to health. That's the importance of unity. And I think we're losing that idea of the strength of unity in this current, this current manifestation of, of struggles in the church. But again, this has only been happening for a few years. And as I said, the church has struggled with these things for for many generations. Point number six, section four in the homily. Hurting any part of the church is hurting the entire church. Knowing these things, therefore, you that are greater, trample not on the less, lest instead of them you injure yourselves. For when they are cut off, the whole body is destroyed. Since, what else is a body than the existence of many members, right? And so hurting any part of the church hurts the entire church, right? This is very apropos to the orthodox experience today, globally, between what's going on in, uh, in Ukraine, I mean, what's going on in the Holy Lands. Um, there is this, this stress and, and I can only think that it is the, the, the effort of the evil one trying to further divide the church, right? So hurting any part is hurting the entire. So that obviously number, point number seven, each member of the church should care for each other with equal care. If now, even the greater members will perish when the less are broken off, these ought to care in like manner for the less, and so as for themselves, inasmuch as in the safety of these the greater likewise remain. So, remember, the, go back to the context. The wealthy were having their own dinners at home. They were not sharing the agape meal with the, with the poor. Oh, my gift is more important than your gift. Oh, I'm more important. You're less important. There's that, 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 that fracturing of the church. In the first century, it was relevant in the fracturing of the church in the fourth century in Antioch, and it's relevant today in the fracturing of the church. But what he wants us to hear is that we should care for each other with equal care. In other words, when we see people who need our help, who may seem insignificant, we have to help that person with as much care as we help the important people, mm -hmm. right? Because in helping the least, who are we helping? Ourselves. Because if the church suffers, is weak, 
is fractured, then all of us suffer. That's the, that's the idea here. All right, section number five, the final verse. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Point number eight. Unity, mutual care, and common priorities is everything. Three things, therefore, here he demands. The not being divided but united in perfection, the having like care for another, and the considering all that happens common, right? When was the last time any of us viewed the church from that vantage point, right? The unity, mutual care, and common priorities. And this thing about when one suffers, all suffer. If we don't believe it, then we are the ones that are in denial. Okay, because if we don't, and this is the next point, if we don't co-suffer, then we're actually lording it over somebody, right? Oh, 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 poor baby. And I don't mean that kind of fake co-suffering, right? Listen to what Chrysostom says here. Point number nine, co-suffering brings mutual care and honor. For if it shared not in the suffering, it would not endure to partake of the care. Wherefore, having said that the members may have the same care for one another, he added, whether one member suffers, all the members suffer with it, or one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. If we are truly united, we will experience the suffering of, of others. And we will be honored when a member of the church is honored. Instead, what tends to happen, because of our fallen human nature, we tend to get jealous. Oh, they got an award. Oh, that person, oh, they're paying attention to them. Oh, they're paying attention to them. Ironically, that very position of jealousy will ultimately be our condemnation in heaven. We have to remember, the life of the church isn't to earn heaven, it is to practice heaven, right? So, if we're going to get to heaven and say, Oh, I can't believe God loves that person. Oh, that person is honored. Well, what about me? Why am I not honored? If we are not genuinely joyful and feel uh, glory for the other person who's being honored by God, then we're going to experience their honor in heaven as hell. So why not practice now? Why not practice suffering with each other and honoring with each other and saying, oh, isn't it great so-and-so got an award? How wonderful. One of our community was honored by the city. One of this, one of that. Instead of falling into those jealousies and competitions. But that's where we tend to go because of our ego. We tend to think we deserve the attention. We, just, we tend to think we deserve the honor, but we don't deserve the suffering. Right? So we don't want to co-suffer because we shouldn't have to suffer. Anyone who is a parent will tell you that love means co-suffering. You cannot love another human being and not feel pain when they suffer. It's just not possible, okay? And of course, that leads us into, you know, chapter 13 with the idea of love. This is where Chrysostom's going. I mean, St. Paul. St. Paul's going to this theme of love, right? That's where he's heading here. And so I'm just giving a little precursor, right? You can't love someone and not suffer when they suffer. 
You cannot love someone and not feel honored when they are honored. Okay, it's impossible. Impossible. Okay. Life application. So now we're moving on to our teaching section. And I call this, treat the church with love, honor, and unity. Remember, this is all about the church now and the unity and the respect uh, of the church. Point number 10, which in the homily is in section number 6. Care for other members of the church as you care for other members of your body. Chrysostom says this, Let us all then, considering these things, imitate the love of these members. Let us not in any wise do the contrary, trampling on the miseries of our neighbor and envying his good things. I, I love that, right? Care for the other members as you care for yourself. Point number 11. When any member of the church is honored, the entire church is honored. So likewise it happens in the church. I mean, if there be any celebrated persons, the community reaps the good report of it. For the enemies are not apt to divide the praises, but connect them together. And if any be brilliant in speech, they do not praise him alone, but likewise the whole church. For they do not say only such a one is a wonderful man, but what? The Christians have a wonderful teacher. And so they make the possession common. The problem with that truth is it's also true in the reverse. And what I mean by that is the side of scandal. No one says, oh, that person misbehaved. They say, oh, the Christians misbehave. No one says, oh, that priest. They say, the priest from St. Nicholas. Right? So there's a double-edged sword here, right? Our unity is that real. And this is why St. Paul says, when one suffer, we all suffer. When one is honored, we all honored, right? When any member of the church is honored, the entire church is honored. Point no, section number seven, point number 12 in the study guide. Division is the result of envy and jealousy. Chrysostom says this, but nothing so divides and separates as envy and jealousy, that grievous disease and exempt from all pardon, and in some respect worse than the root of all evils. For the covetous is then pleased with himself has received, when himself has received, but the envious is then pleased when another has failed to receive, not when he himself has received. Right? We're so happy when they don't get what they, ah, they, don't, they, they didn't win. Ha, 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 ha. We're almost like, we're, we'd be happy if we won, but if we're not going to win, instead of being happy that they won, we'd rather they don't win either, right? We're like, well, if I can't be honored, no one's going to be honored. No one's going to win, right? Isn't it amazing? So Chris has wrote this in the 4th century. St. Paul in the 1st century. Man, we still haven't learned, have we? Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. I mean, we're still dealing with the same fallen, broken passions that the first Christians did. It's a little bit worse now. Well, that's a good point. Is it worse now? We were having a conversation earlier. But there's always a pre-Bible study conversation, by the way, which you cannot participate in if you don't come in person. We were talking about, you know, Hollywood and... Are they worse now than they were before this? That. I'm not quite sure they're so much worse as they are just open. It's like people don't hide their sins anymore. I think they always did them. They just preferred to hide them before. You know, um, but we are still struggling with our sense of unity because we're fighting against our own passions. Okay. So, I mentioned this during the pre-conversation, right? Point number 13, only demons are envious of people. 
Remember I mentioned this is from the devil. A demon is envious, both of men, not of any demon, but of men, not of any demon, but thou being a man, envious men, and withstandest what is your own tribe and family, which not even a demon does. Think about that. We're acting worse than the demons when we envy each other. They don't envy each other. They envy us because we're higher than them. Right? And so when we envy each other, we're actually behaving worse than the demons. If that doesn't call us to repentance, I don't know what will. Okay. I like this point, number 14. Good rivalry is imitation of good things. This is wholesome rivalry. Imitation without contention. Not to grieve at the good things of others, but to be vexed at our own evils, the contrary to which is the result of envy. In other words, when we see people behaving well, we see people being honored, good rivalry is I want to do what they're doing to be honored. And it, in, in a way, it inspires us to a better behavior. It inspires us to a better life, right? As opposed to envying the other person, he's like, use that to bring yourself higher. I think it's a really interesting connection. And that... Uh, that difference between envy and inspiration, I think, is a very fine line. I think it's a very fine line. Okay. Last point. We're getting out early tonight. I hope that doesn't offend anybody. But as we that, if there's any questions on the live chat, it's been a very slow live chat tonight. Ah, uh, maybe. Maybe, yeah. Okay. Flee from envy and pray for those who envy. Let us flee it then, beloved, and neither envy others nor fail to pray for our enviers and do all we can to extinguish their passion. Neither let us feel as the unthinking do, who being minded to exact punishment of them, do all in their power to light up their flame. But let us not do so. Rather, let us weep for them and lament. I mean, jealousy is one of the hardest things for us to deal with as Christians, right? Because no one likes to suffer. We all want to have better things than we have. That's part of our, our reality. But I think the... The, the difference that Chrysostom wants us to see is let the, the, the good in others be the inspiration for us to be good. And, you know, it's kind of like, like in the workings of the church, right? When the church says, okay, we all have a different role to play. This is what Chris has been talking about in the past few weeks and St. Paul, the different talents and the different gifts and the different, you know, blessings. All of us have an important part. So on the one hand, we honor each other's different roles. But instead of saying, why can't I be important like that guy? say, let me be the best, you know, St. Paul uses the body parts, right? Let me be the best foot that I can be. Instead of saying, why can't I be the eyes? Let me be the best foot that I can be. Let me be the best hand. Let me be the best ear. Let me be the best nose. Use the, the honor of the others to inspire us to better things rather than just jealousy. Because the jealousy will head us off into division and separation and schism and separation leads us to death. Because when the body part breaks apart, the entire body dies. I think that's, that's the essence. And I think it's a great place for us to end for the year. Because the next six weeks, 
right? All about preparing for Christmas and we're in the fast and our society is in the middle of keeping up with the Joneses and you know you have to buy more presents and you have to this and you have to that. There is this, there's this frenzy that our society is following that we don't have to follow. We can honor the honored and be thankful for what we have knowing that what we have is of equal value to the church and to God. Right? So it can both calm our, if you'll excuse the expression, our depression. You know, like, oh, woe is me. I'm not this, I'm not that. No, we're equally valuable. We're equally honored. So we can knock ourselves out of the self-humiliation without diminishing the others. I think it's a great challenge, especially in this Christmas season, because... Boy, in the next six weeks, everything's about competition. You know, buying the biggest present and buying the nicest this and having the this and the that. And it, you know, every time you turn around, everything's about competition. And Chris, I would say, let good rivalry would be using to call us to something better rather than just comparison. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Good to have you guys with us. Hope you'll come back. I don't see any questions. Like I said, it was a slow night online, maybe because everyone's on, on Thanksgiving vacation. Yes. Have a blessed Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Don't overindulge too much with turkey. Yes. Turkey will put you to sleep, all the tryptophan, right? But then we continue with the fast once Thanksgiving is over. All right, God bless you. Again, we'll see you all on January 30th. Until next time, don't forget to live a new life in Christ. Be Transfigured is a production of Be Transfigured Ministries in cooperation with the St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Tarpon Springs, Florida. We depend upon your generosity to maintain our ministry. You can make a safe online donation when you visit our website, liveanewlifeinchrist.org.